This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about the relationship between tensor products and localization. So um, first of all, we define a module M is called flat if um, taking tensor products with M preserves exactness. This means that if zero goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero is exact. This implies zero goes to M tensor A, goes to M tensor B, goes to M tensor C, goes to zero is exact. Um, as we saw, um, this bit is always exact, whatever M is. So the key point is that if A is submodule of B, then M tensor A is a submodule of M tensor B. For example, over the integers, we saw that Z modulo 2Z is not exact because as we saw about three or four times, there's an example where this doesn't preserve exactness. Um, over any ring R, R itself is exact because R tensored over R with the module A is just isomorphic to A. So tension with R doesn't actually do anything to this. Um, flatness as a concept was introduced by Sayre in the 50s and Grothendieck later showed that it was absolutely fundamental in algebraic geometry. Um, it's a bit of a mystery why it is so important. Um, it's a, not at all an intuitive concept. Um, you can see it's not obvious because people were studying commutative algebra for about a century before Sayre introduced this concept. Um, informally, what flatness means, um, so M being flat means the modules MP vary nicely. So what is MP? Well, this is the localization of M at a prime ideal P, which, and we're going to explain what this is fairly shortly. So we can sort of think of M as being something like a family of modules MP over local rings, and flatness kind of says this family varies nicely without jumping suddenly or anything like that. Um, so flatness turns up a lot when you are studying families of modules or families of schemes. You tend to want to put a flatness condition on this family in order to force it to be well behaved, where well behaved is defined to be flat. Um, so main result we're going to prove this lecture is that the localization Rs to the minus one is a flat um, R module. This is a special case of the fact that localization, such as this, is always nice. It has pretty much any good property you can think of, and flatness is one good property, so it turns out that local, localizing R produces a, a flat R module. Um, so what we're going to do is um, define um, a module ms to the minus one. So we recall we defined R s to the minus one for R a ring and s a multiplicative subset of R. And the elements are of the form are of the form R over S, where this is really a sort of equivalence class of ordered pairs. And R over S is equal to zero if and only if R times S1 equals naught for some S1 in S. And addition is defined using the usual rules of high school arithmetic. And we're going to define M S to the minus one um, in the same way. 
So what we do is we're just going to copy the construction of our s to the minus one, replacing r by s, except we're not actually going to do this because we've already done it for r, and doing it again for m is almost exactly the same and not very interesting to watch. So all that, all that, I'll just summarize what happens. The elements are all of the form m over s for m in m and s in s, of course, and m over s is zero if and only if m times s1 equals naught for some s1 in s. And from this, you, you see that m1 over s1 is equal to m2 over s2, provided that m1 s2 minus m2 s1 times s equals naught for some S in S. So this is just like the definition of the localization of R, except you're replacing R by any module. Um, so the key point is that M mapping M to M S to the minus one preserves exactness. In other words, if we've got a sequence naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught, which is exact, this implies naught goes to A, S to minus one, goes to B, S to minus one, goes to C, S to minus one, goes to naught is exact. And the main problem is to show that if we've got an element, um, so in, in here, so suppose some element b s to the minus one in b s to the minus one has image zero in c s to the minus one. Um, then um, um, b has image c in c for some element c and B s to the minus one maps to C s to the minus one, which is equal to zero. So C s one equals zero for some s one in s by definition of when something is zero in, in this localization. Um, so B s one has image zero in C. So B s one is in the image of A. So it's the image of, say, some element A in A. But then, um, um, but then B S minus one equals B S one S1 to minus 1, S to minus 1 equals A, S1, S to minus 1 is in the image of A, S to minus 1. So this proves that localization of modules preserves exactness, which is um, one of the reasons why localization is such an easy thing to, to deal with. Um, we define the localization of M at a prime P to be m s to minus one, where s is equal to the complement of p. So m p is a module over r p, and can be thought of as, 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 as a sort of stalk of m at the prime p. Um, so just as r becomes a sheaf of rings over the spectrum of r, um, M is a sort of sheaf of modules over the sheaf of rings. So this is very heavily used in algebraic geometry. You turn modules over rings into sheaves over, over the spectrum. We're not going to use this very much, but I'll just sort of sketch what you do. So just as for rings, for each open set U of F, you assign it to the ring RF to the minus one. For, 
for modules, for each open set U of F, you assign it to the module M um, F to the minus one, which is of course a module over this ring. And for each prime, we have a stalk, which is the um, localization of R at P. And similarly for each prime P, we have a stalk, which just is just the localization of M at P. Um, what this does is construct something called a quasi-coherent sheaf. And you don't need to remember what that is or how to spell it because we're not going to use it anymore this course. Um, so informally, as I mentioned earlier, you can think of M as being a sort of, when you think of it as being the sheaf of modules, you think of it as being a family of these modules over local rings parameterized by points of the spectrum. Um, anyway, let's get back to the proof that um, our S is flat. So, sorry, we want to show that R S to minus one is flat. Well, um, we want to show that um, mapping um, a module A to A tensored over R with R S to minus one preserves exactness. So let's put a question mark because that's what we're trying to prove. We know that A goes to um, A S to minus one preserves exactness. And now you can guess what we have to do. All we have to do is to show that A S to minus one is, when I say equal to, I mean canonically isomorphic to, A tensored over R with R S to minus one. And this is easy to do because we can construct inverse maps in each direction. So first of all, we can take a s to the minus one to a tensored with s to the minus one. And on the other hand, we can take a tensored r s to the minus one to a r s to the minus one. And it's easy to check that these two maps are inverses of each other. So these two things are really the same. Um, so this shows that R S to the minus one is flat as an R module. Um, and we've also seen that tensioning with this is the same as localizing with respect to S, which is also kind of useful. Um, so localizing is flat. I better just have a warning that taking quotients um, doesn't preserve flatness. So we've seen that R over I is not us usually flat as an R module. So we've seen an example of this. We've seen Z over 2Z is not flat. Similarly, taking quotients of... Um, modules by ideals is not um, does not preserve exactness. So if zero goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero, is a sequence of R modules. You can try looking at the modules naught goes to A over IA, goes to B over IB, goes to C over IC, goes to zero, and ask whether this is exact. And as you can probably guess by now, it isn't exact because it sort of fails to be exact here. Um, in fact, A over I, A is really just the same as A tensored over R with R over I. And we've just seen that R over I isn't flat in general. Um, so, um, so taking quotients is a sort of bit of a difficult property, but localizing is a much easier and better behaved property. Um, so what do flat modules actually look like? Um, well, we can answer that in some simple cases. So suppose R is an integral domain. Actually, what I'm about to say works for all rings, but you have to be a little bit more careful about definition. So I'll just take it to be an integral domain for simplicity. Then we notice that naught goes to R, goes to R, goes to R over AR, goes to naught is exact, where this is multiplication by A, 
and A is non-zero. Now let's tensor this with M. And suppose M is flat. Then we get naught goes to M, goes to A, M is exact. We can map it on to M over AM, but I don't really care about this. And what this means is that multiplication by A is injective on M. This is again for A not equal to zero. So flat modules are torsion free. So torsion means um, MA is equal to naught for some A not equal to naught in um, R and M not equal to naught. So if this happens, we say the module has torsion with M. So torsion free means that no element of M is killed by anything other than zero. And um, the converse of this is sometimes true. So for Z, torsion-free modules are flat. And I may or may not prove this later. Um, this is actually true for all principal ideal domains and also for some slightly more general rings. So for Z, torsion-free is just the same as flatness. In particular, for finitely generated modules over Z, torsion free, sorry, flat modules are just the same as free modules because those are the same as torsion free modules. Um, so, why don't we just use torsion freeness instead of flatness? Well, it turns out that for most rings, torsion free doesn't mean flat. We'll see lots of examples later on. And torsion-free modules don't really behave all that well, but flat modules do behave very nicely. So um, we should really use torsion. We should use flatness, not torsion-freeness in general. Um, so I'm going to finish with three useful properties relating flatness with localization. So the first says that vanishing is local. So there's a sort of catchphrase. What does that mean? It means a module M is equal to zero if and only if M localized at P is zero for all primes, or for that matter, for all maximal ideals. So we can test whether a module is zero by looking at whether it's zero locally at each prime. And this is easy to show. Suppose M, M is equal to naught for all maximal ideals. And pick a little X in M. Then X is equal to naught in the localization M, M. This means... Um, the annihilator of X is not contained in the maximal ideal M because um, X is naught in this if and only if X is killed by something not in M. So the annihilator of X is not in any maximal ideal. Here we're assuming that MP is naught for all maximal ideals. So the annihilator of X is equal to the whole ring R, so X is equal to zero. So we've shown that if all localizations are zero and X is an element of M, then M must be, then X must be zero. So if all these vanish, then M vanishes. Um, the next useful property, useful property number two, is exactness is local. What this means is that naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught is exact. If and only if naught goes to A, P, goes to B, P, goes to C, P, goes to naught is exact for all prime P. And as before, we could just take maximal P if we wanted. And 
Um, the first implication follows because um, localization preserves exactness, as, as we showed in the, in the first part of the lecture. For the other implication, um, what we do is we just observe that the kernel of B goes to C, modulo the image of A goes to B, vanishes if and only if this sequence is exact in the middle by definition. So if we localize it, this at M, then we see that this is equal to the kernel of B goes to C, localized at M, modulo the image of A goes to B, localized at M as um, 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 our M is flat. And now um, we see that this is zero if and only if um, this is zero. So if we miss out the M here, we see that this is zero if and only if this is zero for all M using, using, using the fact that this vanishes if and only for all its localizations vanish. So that shows that this sequence is exact if and only if this is exact for all ma maximal ideals P. So that's very nice because we can test whether a sequence is exact just by testing it locally at all primes. Um, the final useful result says that flatness is local. In other words, M is flat if and only if MP is flat for all primes P. And by now you can guess, we can replace this by all maximal elements P. So again, this is very useful because we can test whether a module is flat just by looking locally at each prime and seeing whether it's flat. Um, well, we're just going to prove one of the implications because the other is pretty easy. In fact, both are pretty easy. So suppose naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught is exact. Um, we want to show that this tensor with M is exact. Um, assuming that MP is flat for all primes P. And all you do is we know that naught, um, all we have to do is to show that naught goes to A tensored over, um, tensored with M, localized M goes to B tensored with M, localized at M goes to C tensored with M localized at M is exact. So we just need to show this is exact for all maximal ideals by part two that we showed on the previous piece of paper. And then we just observe that this is equal to A M tensored over R M with M M. Yes, that should be A tensored over R. And this is equal to something similar and this is equal to something similar. Um, so if M localized at little m is flat, then this sequence is exact for all little m. So, um, so, uh, so this sequence tends with m is exact. So we've shown that m is flat if and only if its um, localization at all maximal ideals is flat. Um, okay, so next lecture we're going to be proving um, another useful property of flatness and then we'll be our next lecture after that we'll be moving on to artinian rings <laughs>